a characteristic of the qualitative research. Not all the studies, of course, are uh, 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 requiring that intense and prolonged contact, but the point is that the researcher goes into the field. The field may be uh, an organization, a workspace, a specific department. It may be a village in the country, uh, a, a, any kind of natural setting. Uh, and therefore, by being in the field, the researcher has the opportunity to capture the actors. Actors are the participants in the study. You know, the actors understanding of the situation that is of interest to the researcher, right? So you, as a researcher then, you can uh, observe how the actors behave, interact with each other, you can engage with them, you can interview them, okay? You can organize focus groups and we'll be talking about this later on. So the, the role of the context in- um, Recording in progress. So the, the role of the context in qualitative research becomes hugely important because it is by understanding the context that several of the researchers' questions will be answered. Okay, So you want to understand the situation that the actors are in and what influences actors' decisions or interactions, uh, kind of, you know, the specific phenomena that the researchers are, uh, are looking for. So... Unlike, therefore, quantitative research where the researcher will ask a specific number of questions in a very standardized manner, in qualitative research, there is little standardization. So little standardized research is, in, in instrumentation. Instead, is with the, the research interactions, conversations. So actually, when it comes to qualitative research, we end up analyzing data sets that is rich with words, right? So most analysis, in fact, is done with words rather than kind of a standardized uh, instrument, right? So we are analyzing the words that have been gathered. Now, those words could mean different things to different people. And that's a challenge in qualitative research. So, and in fact, as a qualitative researcher, you have to be careful as to what interpretations you are given to recording the stopped data. You are collected. So it's, pos it's possible that there are multiple interpretations available in the data you have collected. But as a researcher, then you have a responsibility to identify yeah. the most compelling interpretation the most meaningful interpretation and pass and present that and pass this uh, you know, into your writing, into your presentations, et cetera. And of course, that interpretation will lead to the development of a theory um, that, uh, you know, that will influence further research in the field. Uh, I got a message that you stopped recording, I think, dear. Is that, do you want me to wait until you start recording again? Uh, no, you can continue because now it's uh, automatically streamed to our YouTube channel. Ah, okay, all right. Okay. Okay. So following this, um, uh, following this, uh, a kind of very uh, uh, early sort of description of qualitative research, um, I would like the opportunity to present my own, uh, a specific study that I've carried out using qualitative research. And then I'll use this uh, to talk specifically about specific qualitative methods. Let me just move to the next slide. I did say earlier that um, qualitative research deals with a lot of work. <laughs> so you go into the field, you collect lots of data. And as this cartoon say here, you know, sometimes we are collecting so much data, we don't know what to do with it. But the main issue is you need to have a plan. So it's not a matter of going into the field, into an organization uh, and just start asking questions and collecting data and thinking about what to do with this data later. That's not how we do qualitative research. So you need 
to have a plan. And this is what we refer to as the uh, research design uh, approach. So every uh, research project you have in mind, whether it's qualitative, whether it's quantitative, needs to have a design, a plan uh, to help you start and make sure that you do things systematically. Next page, please. Oh, here. Okay. So here is a, a, a project that I would like to present to you, one of uh, our research uh, projects based on qualitative research. In fact, all of my studies uh, have been based on, uh, are based on qualitative research methods. So this is one that I hope the participants will um, relate to. Uh, it's about the use of social network insights, specifically Facebook. Okay, um, And uh, we study uh, uh, Facebook uh, a few years back in collaboration with uh, colleagues at the University of Bath in the UK. And the, really the driving aim, what we were really interested in doing with this study was to understand how social networking sites, Facebook specifically, um, uh, is, is used across different age groups. So at the time we noticed that uh, there was an increase in literature uh, about Facebook and other social networking sites, but this literature had primarily focused on the younger members of the population. So teenagers and uh, a, a, a kind of young adults. And we wanted to, get the opportunity to understand how um, members across, uh, users of Facebook across different age groups use sites and what Facebook means to them. Yeah, what does Facebook mean to people from different age groups? So that for us, so we were not collecting anything and everything around Facebook. We had a driving aim that helped us to design the study. What we think was novel about this study, and, and remember when you are doing qualitative research, especially if you are academics and you are seeking research, you need to show that there is a, a, a degree of novelty in your study so that you are not just repeating what other people have done, but rather you are able to distinguish what you are doing to what has already been published and therefore show the unique contribution of your study. So this is quite important when it comes to publishing your research in academic peer reviewed journals. So in the specific study, what was novel? You know, obviously we thought what was novel was that we were looking not just at one age group, but rather across different age groups. So the way we included different age groups in our understanding of how uh, people uh, use um, uh, Facebook and how they interact within this online uh, kind of social media site. So we were looking to examine generational differences. But another novelty came from the way we design the study. You know, remember what I said before, design, research design is hugely important. So you should design a study based on what you are seeking to examine, right? So the way we approach the study um, was quite novel in our view. Um, and we wanted to understand how people viewed faith, people across different generations, age groups viewed Facebook. So how did we study that? Well, we decided to use metaphors. And metaphors stand for kind of visual representations, we specifically look for um, uh, what Facebook social networking sites stand for uh, and, uh, and what rep representations, visual representations the users of Facebook will give to, in, to, to this online space and how they interacted within this online space. So we brought metaphors as the novel way to examine interactions within Facebook. So metaphors, of course, are common 
uh, within organizational research, uh, not so common within the information systems field, um, but we felt that it was a very powerful and enriching way uh, to help us um, capture what we were seeking to achieve. So metaphors provide as a, you know, this is a slide here that captures kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, what metaphors stand for. They provide a frame of reference. Uh, when we think of metaphors, we think of perhaps an image that relates to a phenomenon that we have in mind. Um, uh, Morgan, who studied metaphors in organizations in 1986, uh, described them as ways of thinking and ways of seeing. So Morgan himself gave examples of metaphors uh, of organizations, such as organizations as machines or organizations are as brains. So obviously when you hear a machine, you have a certain image in mind. And what he was saying is that for some people, organizations do operate like machines, a kind of a step-by-step, -step, a mechanical way of operating. But organizations could also be seen as brains because there's a lot of human power within uh, organizations that, that drives, uh, you know, how organizations operate and, uh, uh, and, 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 and kind of direct uh, it, uh, it, it itself. So different this images that we could use to relate one phenomenon to, uh, you know, to, to another, to relate an image to a phenomenon that we're interested in. And when we do use this, uh, um, uh, these metaphors, they help us to understand a phenomenon better. They facilitate learning. They kind of build our imagination. Um, you know, when some organization is, is a machine, it kind of it helps you imagine how an organization is kind of operating, right? Um, and, and metaphors are particularly good uh, when it comes to examining not so well understood phenomena. So they are very effective, in fact, tools, uh, investigative tools for examining not so well understood phenomena. And in our case, at the time, we felt that Facebook, yes, it's, a, it's a, a widely used platform, but do we actually know what it means for the people, you know, across different generations? So it was a phenomenon that wasn't that well understood in our view, and therefore metaphors kind of made sense. So we use, we brought metaphors in our approach. So how we collected um, participants, um, uh, from across different generations of uh, views of what Facebook stands for. We carried out focus groups. Focus groups, uh, uh, as earlier research said, they are really useful when generating metaphors because uh, the, the people who gather around the table, they kind of uh, help to build uh, a discussion and that uh, image that could be used to describe a phenomenon. And in our study, when, in, when we went into focus groups, so we organized focus groups with different age groups. Um, for each focus group, to these focus groups, we presented a list of metaphors because we wanted to help the participants to start thinking of Facebook kind of meta metaphorically. So we uh, imposed uh, metaphors, uh, to them, we presented a list of metaphors to them, and we asked them to consider whether these um, are suitable metaphors to describe what Facebook stands for. Do they agree with uh, any of those that we presented? We presented metaphors such as marketplace. Do you see Facebook as a marketplace? Is it a club for you? Is it a zoo? Is it a jungle? Is it a family? Is it a home? Is it a festival, playground, or is it something else? Um, and we asked them to choose the most suitable metaphor. Following that, in that focus group, we asked them to draw a picture. So we actually gave them flip charts or A4 pieces of, uh, of paper, whatever we had available. Um, and, uh, and we asked them to use that 
a paper to draw a picture of their chosen metaphor. So for example, they might have uh, described or agreed in their focus group that Facebook is a zoo, right? And then they drew a picture of a zoo uh, and, uh, and then we engage with them, kind of trying to get them to explain to us, so what does this picture mean? Why did you draw a zoo? Why did you have, what does the lion stand for? What does the tiger, what does the monkey or, or, or kind of, you know, whatever appears on the picture kind of stand for? So we acting as facilitators, myself and my, uh, my colleague, uh, we acted as facilitators and we asked all, this, all those questions. And as a qualitative researcher, you need to engage with the participants to kind of uh, try to understand why they have given the answer they, 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 they gave you, right? So we wanted to prompt that discussion around the drawing to, uh, to get them to give us a good description of the visual metaphor they presented to us. And I'm going to show you some images later on. So it's quite fascinating, actually, what they came up with. Now, the data collected, um, we talked to a total of 76. We had 76 participants. Uh, we had um, different age groups. We had teenagers, young adults, and mature users. So we had focus groups. We had six uh, focus groups with teenagers, six focus groups with young adults, and five with mature users, uh, 78 participants uh, in, uh, in total. Uh, so this is our list of participants. In the initial data analysis, um, when we started analyzing the data, um, the data consisted of those visual metaphors that I talked about, but also the transcripts of the, uh, of the discussion that took place in focus groups. So we had a, a rich data set um, from all the participants in, uh, in the study. So initial analysis showed that there were indeed generational differences. So teenagers, young adults, uh, mature users kind of saw Facebook in a different way. And in fact, they described it differently. So the teenagers um, uh, uh, picked a playground, often picked sort of playground, the majority actually picked playground as the main metaphor to describe Facebook. In one case, they also describe it as a jungle. In another case, they describe it as a zoo. But the most commonly used among the teenage uh, focus groups was playground. Now, the young adults, uh, so these were kind of early 20s. Uh, these were university students, postgraduate students that we talked to. Um, and uh, again, their majority, they talked about a nightclub or a pub. Um, a place they go um, to socialize, to play games, to have fun, uh, to network, but it's a place they go uh, kind of at the end of the day, after they finish their university study, their university work, they've done their uh, kind of homework, et cetera, kind of at the end of the day into the night where they are looking for opportunities to relax and, uh, and, and have fun, right? So you go to a nightclub, yeah? What, whereas the teenage groups, they saw Facebook as a place you go after school. You know, you go to a playground after school. You play with your friends. The mature users, 50 to 60 years old, uh, in fact, all the focus groups of the mature users, five focus groups there, they chose we, in, without knowing <laughs> that other focus group chose also social club, they, they all chose social club. So that was interesting. And this was a, a space they go where they meet with their offline friends. So the same friends they meet in the cafe, uh, in their neighborhood or you know, out after work, et cetera. These are the people they also meet online or they meet family members and they kind of go to a club, social club and they, um, you know, have a coffee, they have a chat, they sit around the table, etc. So collectively, this data shows to us that the metaphors that were chosen by the different generational groups to describe face, 
face uh, face group um, indicated spatial and temporal uh, characteristics. So spatial in the sense that they all talk about the space, kind of Facebook as the space. They go, right? So it's a space they go and visit. Uh, and they go to this at a specific time. So it, there's a temporal dimension. They go after school. They go at nighttime. Um, they go in the evening uh, to see their friends and kind of catch up with family members. So these were some of the initial uh, uh, findings that we talked about. And here I'm going to show to you some of the examples, some of the data that we actually got. Um, remember, we, are, we gave them a flip chart like this, what we see here, a flip chart, and we asked them to draw the, the metaphor they had in mind. And in the specific case, they chose a playground, right? So you can see this is the teenagers, um, one of the teenagers group, how busy uh, the, the picture is. There are lots of people lots of interactions. Um, and, and in fact, what you see here on the left-hand side is, uh, is an extract from the description they gave us from the transcript we, we captured during our uh, conversation with the members of the focus group. There were many tight groups of teenagers. They were socialized and entertaining. Uh, so you can see lots of people here. All these are teenagers in the playground, um, they're, you know, going down the slide, the roundabout here, uh, there's a bike shed here, but there's also bullying. So re they recognize that there's a lot of bullying kind of on the side, kind of hidden behind the bike shed. Um, yeah, people doing their, I can say they're gossipers here, people who gather together and they chat about others. Uh, there are people here kissing, so they meet to, to kids and kind of needing people. They have been described as uh, needing people. The people who kind of showing off their posers, they take selfies and uh, upload them uh, online. Um, but they also, so a very busy picture, an image of what's going on in the playground uh, that they visit in this uh, Facebook kind of type playground. But there is a gate here, kind of a, a boundary here. Uh, a fence, as they describe it. And they recognize that outside uh, this fence, there are outsiders. And these are the outsiders, people who are not welcome to come into the playground. And some of them is kind of parents. You know, there is a mom here who is very concerned about what's going on in the playground. So she stands nearby keeping an eye. So they recognize that parents, you know, are concerned about, you know, certain things that happen. Um, on Facebook, but there are also these kind of weird guys, so this creepy guy here, an older guy um, who, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he, he's a stranger. They don't want to have anything to do uh, with him, but they kind of recognize that there might be these weird guys who, um, and they have to be kind of keeping a distance from, from them. So this is an example of one of the uh, images that were collected. And this is another example. This is from the mature users, the social club. Uh, the, all the mature users, in fact, describe Facebook metaphorically as being a social club. And you can see one of the drawings that we got. It's a less busy picture, less people, right? Um, people go and sit around the table. So you can see these uh, circles here. These are tables. People sit around and they catch up. Um, they may go and uh, talk about their dinners, what they have eaten the day before, or the party they attended, etc. cetera. Um, so there are a few people, a few old, um, a few people here, uh, part of the description, a few old but sturdy tables, uh, had people sitting around them, traditional pub games, um, long wooden bar, also private function area. So this this here on the right hand side is a private fun function where uh, family members could meet and uh, have a private conversation. Uh, most of the users are ladies, gentlemen in their 50s. They enjoy being in the company of their friends. They're kind of very calm, a peaceful uh, environment. Um, 
there's also a poser here. So they recognize that uh, there might be people there who kind of go and uh, to show off again. So they they draw a picture of someone kind of dancing in the middle of them. And, and this crack on the wall, you can see the amount of details that the participants put into the design of these pictures. So there is this crack on the wall showing that uh, the, the users were aware that Facebook is not completely private. There's always a way for someone to kind of spy, you know, spy on you. Yeah. And this is uh, the image, one of the images that was produced by the young adults group, um, the 20 kind of mid 20s um, uh, age group. Uh, they describe Facebook metaphorically as being a nightclub. Um, and again, they gave in their description, they were quite detailed as to uh, what goes on in this nightclub. So they say there were two bouncers at the at the door. So here is the is a door on the right hand side. There are two bouncers of check-in who is who goes in and out in this nightclub. There are bars, there are tables, there are chairs. There's a busy dance floor. There's a huge flat screen. Um, so people watch uh, 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 sort of football, etc. Uh, there's a snooker table here. Um, there's bar. people gather, uh, go to the bar to get a drink, uh, and uh, and they stand there. That's their opportunity to to network and meet new people. Um, others, of course, they sit around the table to catch up with their their, their friends. Uh, and there are some older people who are not particularly welcome. So you can see this person here. He sits on his own on the side uh, of, the, of, of, of the room. Um, nobody wants to interact with them. Yeah. So a, a, a detailed enough picture, not as detailed as the one uh, designed um, by the teenagers uh, earlier on. So I presented to you the data set that we collected in the specific study. So what do this mean? You know, remember analysis of the data um, matters. So we don't collect data just for the sake of collecting data. There needs to be a reason for collecting data. And of course, the reason for us was really to understand how Facebook is, is used. Um, kind of broad question initially to understand how Facebook is used across different generations. But as we begin, began to engage more with the data, uh, we realized that the data were talking to us about the concept of normality. And normality was not a concept that we had in mind when we started the study. So it was not a priority theme. We didn't have in mind normality when we went into uh, the, the field. So normality stands for what is approved and what is kind of shared uh, and routine in people's, um, you know, in people's sort of practices, right? Um, but normality emerged during this analysis stage when we kept going back to the data, uh, watching, kind of looking at these images, trying to make sense of what they were telling us sort of collectively. And when we were reading the transcripts, the words kind of normal or it's normal came out a lot of time. So people were talking, oh, it's normal to do this online. Or these are the normal people uh, in, in this playground, but the people outside the playground that are not normal, they are abnormal. Um, one group you know, suggested that the normal people were the ones who have a litter of each other's characters. Um, so you know, people talk about what's normal by revisiting their experiences uh, and their use of Facebook. And, and that led us to consider normality as the key concept, theoretical concept, um, and the theoretical contribution, in fact, of the study. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and of course, Yes, there, in any situation, there is what is normal, but also what is abnormal. And abnormal is the opposite of normal. So if normality refers to those approved and shared practices and routines, 
abnormality is the opposite. Is though it's it, abnormality refers to those practices and routines that are not um, those practices that are not shared. Uh, they are not approved. They are disapproved, and in fact, they are isolated. They are not routines to everybody. Just kind of the isolated encounters and practices. That's what abnormality stands for. And there was evidence of abnormality in the descriptions of uh, the user's experience with uh, Facebook. So people talk about the creeping looking man on the edge of the playground, the person who wants to come in the playground, but uh, no, we don't want him there. And they kind of push him out. Or, or the people who show off, these are the people, who, it's not us, it's just there are some people here who like to show off, but it's not us, you know, we are kind of normal people, we don't do these kind of things. So the theoretical contributions of the study, we, we in the study, we, we identify this concept of normality, normality within the online space, the social networking, uh, side. So we presented it as a key concept in exploring online interactions. So that was one of the key arguments we've made in the study. Uh, another contribution the study made was around the generational differences, how different age groups use social networking sites, but they, they normalize, uh, um, they make it kind of part of their routine, right? So they make the use of Facebook part of their routine, but they do it differently. So what's normal for the teenagers is not normal for the mature users or even the young adults. And of course, another contribution of the study was the way we use the metaphors, those metaphorical images uh, in, in, in helping us to understand the richness in the online interactions that the users of Facebook have experienced. A study was published in, in 2017 in the Information Technology and People. And, um, and the year after, we, we were given uh, uh, a publisher's the Emerald Literati Award for, for Excellence. So we got uh, an award for the, for the study. Uh, we kind of prom prompted me to present it here that uh, it was a kind of novel project for us when we started it you know we didn't anticipate that we will talk about normality but you can see how with qualitative data sets you kind of embark on a journey on a journey that you know it's quite exciting it's kind of an adventure you collect data that is relevant to your topic. Remember, you always need to have a research question to guide the collection of the data. But then you need to kind of allow the data to lead to um, a kind of the, to, to interest in sort of findings and be open to, uh, to, to those findings and, and construct um, uh, kind of the theory around what you are finding rather than impose a theory on their findings. I'll, uh, so I presented, I've taken this time uh, to present the study. I'm, I'm, I stop here to ask any, uh, if, if you have any questions about the study, the specific study before I move on. Um, and um, yeah, and, uh, how the study was carried out, the theory, the concept, anything you want to ask me. Yeah, the, thank you, Professor Nikki. Kira-kira mm, ada yang mau ditanyakan? Okay, uh, I think while we are waiting for uh, questions from the students and also uh, my colleagues here, I have some questions for you, Prof. Nikki. It, it is such a coincidence because yesterday we talked about this paper with my friends. <laughs> so <laughs> we have some questions. Uh, the first question is, um, we wonder how did you come up with the first metaphors? Because we think mm, when you when you have the first metaphors, it sounds like uh, you you expose yourself to the possibility of driving the participants to a particular answer. So yeah. how you deal with that? Thank you. Yeah, and that, that's thank you, dear. That's uh, that's a very fair sort of question, you know, to to us. Um, and, and there is a challenge, you know, as a, as a researcher, as a qualitative researcher, you need to avoid uh, 
influencing the participants of your study. You know, so you don't want the participants to give you the answers that you want. You want to give them kind of the freedom to express themselves, to share their stories, their views, without feeling that you are influencing them in any way. And I can see why you've asked that question. Uh, we could have done that differently. We could have prompted them to think of metaphors without giving them any examples. Uh, why we gave them examples? So we didn't want to influence them. That was uh, something that needs to be clear. Our intention was not to influence them. When we presented metaphors such as marketplace, club, playground, zoo, jungle, etc., um, our intention was not to influence them. We we use those as examples. We want them to prompt them to start thinking of Facebook in a metaphoric way. So how would you describe Facebook uh, metaphorically? And here are some examples to get you thinking, but don't you don't have to stay with those examples. And in fact, we had, we had um, participants who came up with others, with other ideas outside the list of metaphors that we, we gave them, yeah? Um, the, remember, the participants were in a focus group. So each focus group had about six to seven participants or uh, yeah, um, five in some instances. Um, and each participant was encouraged to think of a metaphor on an individual basis, right? Uh, and we just gave them a list. And then we prompted them to, as a group, to discuss the various metaphors that they thought about and agree on one. Right? So they had then a choice, not our choice of metaphors, but their choice of metaphors. Okay. You see, and, uh, so, and some of the metaphors they came up were outside the list we gave them. Mm -hmm. uh, what about uh, how did you come up with the first metaphors? Did you do uh, like a brainstorming first bit? Sorry, can you hear me? How did uh, yeah. you, you repeat, please? Yeah. yeah. You repeat. How did you come up with the first metaphors? I mean, how how you come up with a uh, zoo? I mean, for the first to to um to introduce the metaphors to the participants. Did you do a uh, brainstorming first? with other researchers or are you got that from previous studies or where yeah uh, uh, not previous studies because at the time they were they were in previous studies looking at metaphors for facebook so we were the first to carry out this kind of study right so previous studies didn't help us in this in this way but there was brainstorming. So, but the brainstorming was among, among ourselves, the members of the research team. A marketplace, uh, why marketplace? Because there are people who use Facebook, you know, to buy and sell, right? Uh, and of course, there's a lot of entertainment taking place within um, uh, Facebook. So then the idea of a club then, then came up, right? Uh, but then, of course, we propose club the young adults became more specific and they said, it's a nightclub, it's not just any club. And the mature users said it's a social club, different to a nightclub, right? It's kind of more, more a, a, a place you go in the late afternoon, evening to catch up with your friends and, you know, that's that sort of place. Um, so even a club has different connotations to different kind of generations and there are different types of clubs as well, right? So, Thank you for the answer, uh, Professor. Uh, ada yang punya pertanyaan, silakan. Jadi uh, penelitian Profesor Niki ini tentang uh, bagaimana Profesor Niki uh, ingin mengetahui dan temannya ya ingin mengetahui uh, apakah uh, Professor. I would like to uh, repeat your explanation in in, in short yes. in Bahasa so that our students can yes, can sure. have a further grasp understanding on on, on your research. Uh, jadi penelitian Profesor Nick ini tentang um, bagaimana uh, apa peser, uh, pengguna Facebook dari berbagai umur itu lihat Facebook. Uh, 
Kemudian uh, Profesor Nikino untuk mengetahui hal itu dia menggunakan uh, metafor. Jadi metafor ini ad, ad, ada uh, yang digunakan oleh Prof Niki adalah metafor dengan menggambar. Jadi Prof Niki ingin melihat orang-orang ini menggambarkan Facebook itu seperti apa. Dan dari sana memang akhirnya beliau bisa melihat bahwa memang beda generasi itu memang beda melihat Facebook. Tetapi lebih daripada itu beliau bisa melihat ternyata beda generasi itu beda melihat perilaku. Jadi generasi yang muda bisa melihat yang dianggap normal di Facebook itu seperti apa, ternyata berbeda dengan generasi yang lain melihat apa yang dianggap normal di Facebook. Begitu ya. Kemudian kira-kira ada yang ingin tanyakan tidak mengenai penelitian yang dilakukan oleh Prof. Niki, Profesor Niki terutama mungkin bagaimana cara melakukan penelitiannya, dari mana itu didapat, kemudian bagaimana Profesor Niki melakukan analisis. Ya. Silakan. Mungkin Mbak Anissa Hudi ada yang ingin ditanyakan, Mbak? Bisa ditaruh di kolom chat. Well, Professor Nikki, uh, actually I have a lot of questions, but I'm waiting for my students to ask questions. Uh, my next question is related to the research design. Why did you choose focus group discussion and not individual interviews? It, I That's mean, a, uh, yeah. yeah. And that's a that's a very good uh, question. And in fact, uh, when we were, when the when the study was going through the review process, that was uh, something that the reviewers also noted. Uh, and we do acknowledge that uh, you know the study has limitations. Every study, uh, you know, has has limitations. And and we could have done interviews. Uh, uh, not on their own. I think there is. And in fact, my my next sort of slides are around focus groups. Um, because there, there are advantages of using focus groups. So bringing a group of people together to explode an issue collectively contributes to richness in their understanding of a specific situation. So in the specific study, we decided to go for, for focus groups because we were looking at uh, groups of, of people, sort of generational sort of groups. Uh, we were looking for uh, uh, teenagers, uh, we were looking for mature users, we were looking for young adults. So in early on, we distinguish different age groups. And instead of interviewing individuals one-to-one, uh, -one, we thought, okay, let's bring people from each group, age group together. And we had a series of these. Uh, focus groups sim with similar age groups, right? Um, and that's why we did it, because of the, the nature of the study in a way justify that choice. Uh, but we do acknowledge and we do acknowledge in the study that uh, a limitation is that we didn't capture the individual voice. Um, the individual voice was captured very early on in the discussions, in the focus group discussions, but then the group moved to the collective voice, you see? So in a way, the individual voice was, was hidden uh, and the collective voice became more powerful. And that's what we capture, the collective voice rather than the individual. Um, so yeah, a, a follow-up study could come back to this and look at the individual. But we, we did feel that having focus groups was um, for, for the study. And, and as I said, you know, there are, I have more in my presentation, so you know I want to talk more about the focus groups and, of course, later on about interviews, right? So you know, depending on the aim of your study, you may choose to use the one or the other, or in fact both. Thank you, Professor Niki. I have some questions from my students, but the questions are in Indonesia. Uh, I would like to translate it to English. Uh, the first question is. Mm, can we generalize the findings of qualitative studies? That's a, that's a very good question. That's, uh, that's often, um, uh, often the issue of generalizability uh, comes up. Um, 
uh, to us as even to us as experienced qualitative researchers, when we write papers and we send them to the review, the editor or the reviewer of the journal will say, can you generalize from this study? How can you generalize from this study? So the issue of generalizability is certainly a, a valid one. Uh, my answer to this is uh, you, the issue of generalizability for qualitative studies is different to that of quantitative studies. In quantitative studies, you deal with uh, big numbers of participants. Often, if you have a survey, you send it out to hundreds of participants, right? So and then you could lead, that could lead to generalization. In qualitative studies, you don't have quantity in the number of participants, but you have the richness in the data you collect from the participants who took part in the study. You know, in our study, we had 78 participants, so not much. If you look at this number from a quantitative perspective, 78 is not a big number, right? So how can you publish a study based on 78, right? But what we have is the quality, is the richness in the data. So you can generalize, uh, not in the quantitative statistical way, you cannot do that. But you know the, the theory, you can generalize from the theory development. Um, and another issue with qualitative data that some researchers um, uh, point to is that for qualitative studies, is the transferability of the data, of the findings that matter more than the generalizability. So what can you transfer from this study? What is it that is important from this study that helps us to understand the phenomenon that we examine? Yeah. So in our study, those theoretical contributions that I presented earlier, are transferable because they talk about uh, users of social networking sites across different age groups being able to normalize their experiences, their interactions, their routines. Yeah. So that is Facebook, and perhaps it's not another different, you know, um, a different type of platform. In a way, it doesn't matter. Facebook was just the empirical setting in the specific study could be any other social media platform. But what we saw in the study is that the participants were able to normalize the, 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 their use of that platform, right? And this tells us something that is indeed transferable to other studies of social networking sites. So transferability, I will say transferability matters a lot more rather than generalizability, but definitely a valid question. Thank you, Professor Niki. Jadi, uh, yang di, terima kasih Mas Mervin. Jadi, maksudnya Professor Niki bahwa biasanya kualitatif ini lebih uh, fokus ke transferability daripada generalis, generalizability. Daripada mengeneralisir, dia lebih berfokus ke transferability. Apa itu transferability? Transfer, transferability adalah apakah temuan yang kita pakai ini dapat digunakan di konteks yang lain. Jadi kalau Prof. Miki bilang, dia akan pakai Facebook. Nah, Facebook ini sebetulnya hanya uh, salah satu contoh dari berbagai macam sosial media yang lain. Yang ditemukan Prof. Miki adalah normality. Jadi dia bisa menunjukkan bahwa uh, di sosial media itu loh, ternyata ada perilaku yang dianggap normal dan tidak normal. Entah itu Facebook, entah sosial media yang lain. Begitu ya Mas Mervin ya. Jadi sekali lagi kualitatif itu punya... Uh, Uh, apa namanya um, uh, kriteria yang lain untuk menentukan kualitasnya dan biasanya bukan uh, bukan uh, generalisir melainkan transferability. Oke, okay, and we go to the next question, but I think it, it, it um, you have already answered this question from Pak Ismiarta. Uh, did you come up with the concept of normality in the first place, or did it appear while analyzing the data? Yeah, it, it was uh, when we were analyzing the data. So in, in a way, the analysis was, um, uh, it, it, 
I, I always refer to doing qualitative research as being an adventure. It's kind of a journey that you start. You don't know where you end up with. And, and, and for me, it's very enjoyable. Not, not everybody may enjoy this kind of, um, of data analysis, but uh, it's, it's, it's kind of enjoyable to, to see where the data is leading you. And the data could lead you to several directions, right? Uh, so we did play around with uh, a number of concepts and we presented at the conference. Um, we got feedback. Um, in fact, it's, re it's really good to present early findings to a conference because, you know, you get ideas from others. You kind of, you see the reaction. That, that's, that's the analysis makes sense or the findings make sense uh, and gives you confidence to, to continue or you may be advised to take a different direction. Uh, but definitely it was through this journey of kind of uh, ex exploration um, uh, we we ended up with the concept of normality. And, and as I said earlier, it, it, in a way, the data led us there, you know, looking through the transcripts, reading those words. Remember, words matter in qualitative research. Um, they, we pay attention to how people talked about their experience. And they say, oh, we are the normal people. We are the normal. They are the strangers. They are the weird. They, they are the abnormal people. So, you know, it kind of it kind of made sense for us to follow what normal means and normality. So yeah, we were definitely influenced by the data. Uh, that it makes me wonder. So at first, you come to the field, you didn't bring any theory, or did you have a theory as a the, as the first step stone, and then? Over time, you change to another to other explanations that can explain it better. Yeah, that's that's yeah. As, I think as researchers, um, we it's, it's very difficult to say you don't have uh, you go into the field without an understanding of theory because you know over over time you you know you read the literature you build your own kind of theoretical understanding. Some theories you like better than others. Um, uh, so it's, it's very difficult to leave those, uh, you know, kind of experiences and, and know-how that you build uh, behind. Um, so you may indeed go into the field with a theory, with a kind of certain expectation of what to find. But as a qualitative researcher, you own it to, um, uh, to the field, to the participants of your study, to remain open as well. Uh, because there might be something there. Something there is, and that's the most exciting part of the start, of doing the research, right? Because that may indeed lead to um, a new theory, something you've never, nobody thought of before, right? So remaining open uh, in the way you analyze the data, and I can talk later about the um, data analysis, it's, it's crucial in order to be able to capture what's important, the, the, the main interpretation, the key interpretation that you can then transfer into your uh, writing uh, and develop your theory. Right? Okay, thank you, Professor Nikki. Uh, the next question is also, uh, I think you have already answered it before uh, about uh, why did you choose Facebook? And I think Professor Nikki has answered it before that Facebook is just one of a, uh, one of a playground and uh, that's uh, that's not the only social media that she's aware that's of. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, the In next question. Wait when you do, yes, yeah, sorry. I, I just wanted to say, um, I often carry out research in organizations, right? So, and every organization, of course, has its own kind of uniqueness, the way of doing things. Um, but when you're doing qualitative research, you need a setting. You need a natural setting, as I said at the very beginning. In the specific case, the setting was Facebook, but it could have been a different platform. It's just Facebook, in a way, was kind of the easier to investigate because, you know, people... It was easier to find participants to take part. The next question is, how long did you take this study? 
we got funding for the study. Uh, we got a small grant um, to carry out the, the study. Um, the, the data collection didn't last long. We got funding uh, to recruit an assistant to help with the uh, uh, data uh, collection, even though in the end we carried out the data collection ourselves. So we, we thought it was uh, it was more important. To, it was quite enjoyable to to carry out the, the data collection ourselves. But we use the research assistant for the literature review, you know, other, uh, you know, other parts of, uh, of the project. So the funding was for the data collection. It was for uh, six months only, but um, it was, you know, it took longer to, you know, to analyze, to write. Qualitative, you know, in, in a way, a challenge with qualitative research is that, uh, you know, the analysis part could take longer uh, as well as the writing uh, could take longer, right? So, and, and so, yeah, it, it became a kind of a lengthy uh, period. So we started the project in 2016. Uh, no, we started in 2015. We got the papers published in 2017. Yeah, and the award in 2018. So it was kind of a couple of years by the time we had the paper published. Yeah. Thank you. I see that the, ne the next question, the rest of the questions, maybe can will we'll be answered by your next presentation. What if you yeah, want yeah, to do your next presentation? And I will read the, the rest of the question after your presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's just a, a matter of timing. So uh, I, I have some slides on focus group. So focus groups, uh, I'll go through them. Uh, then I have some slides on interviews. I may skip some of the slides depending on, on the time. Uh, and I want to leave a bit of time in the end for the analysis, which I think is also uh, in, in important. Again, I may have to skip some of the flight, slides, but um, I'll start sharing. Okay. So a bit about uh, focus groups, especially for those in the audience who may not have uh, experience uh, with uh, the uh, uh, kind of collecting qualitative data. So focus groups uh, often involve uh, gathering a small group of participants together. It could be six to 10. Uh, my experience um, is, is, is kind of about five, six, seven members in a, in a focus group. Um, and there's always a moderator, a facilitator there. Uh, because, you know, as the name says, a focus group, you are bringing people together to focus their discussion on a specific topic. So as a researcher, you have to be able to moderate that discussion so you get the, uh, you know, the, the viewpoints, the data you want. Focus groups are very common in market research, in consumer research, um, but uh, they are increasingly used in qualitative, kind of academic qualitative uh, research as a uh, as well, it's a form of interview, but um, it's non-directive. You you are kind of facilitating a conversation. You may, you know, as we have done in in our case, we present a Facebook, different kind of metaphorical perspective of Facebook. Which one do you think? And they're kind of leaving them to think about it, to engage with each other, to decide on a viewpoint collectively. So you should not direct the, the interview and the discussion, uh, even though you have to stay within um, the, 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 the main theme that is of your interest. Uh, within a focus group, clearly you're gathering a wide range of viewpoints. Uh, and as a moderator, of course, um, you have to ensure that all the members uh, participate. It's a great way for exploratory research, especially when you're looking at new topics that there hasn't been much um, uh, written about. And so you've heard about my use of focus groups. And now, you know, maybe turn to the participants, uh, you know, think of, uh, you know, you can write in the chat, um, uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of focus groups? You know, may just maybe take a couple of minutes to pause here. Yes. To collect thoughts, yeah. 
silakan uh, uh, teman-teman <laughs> mahasiswa mungkin ada yang ingin menuliskan apa sih manfaat dan kelebihan dan kekurangan dari fokus grup menurut anda semua. I have to translate it in Indonesia, perhaps they miss it. Ya, silakan. And please use the chat. You can use the chat to 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 write. And and the purpose is that we collate, so we kind of learn from each other. I'm sure some of you focus groups, you may have some um, uh, thoughts on the disadvantages of focus groups as well. Ya, silakan coba. Uh... Kira-kira begitu, uh, kalau kita fokus grup tuh nanti apa sih kelebihannya, kemudian apa kekurangannya. Barangkali uh, bisa berangkat dari misal segi waktu, atau apa kita uh, kita lihatnya nanti, uh, seperti apa sih komentarnya Profesor Niki terhadap apa yang kita pikirkan. Yeah. Uh, they have already answered it, but in Indonesia, I will, uh, I will translate it. Uh, From Fauzan, it says that maybe uh, one opin uh, somebody's opinion can be influenced by others in the group. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. That's one of the problems of the of focus groups that there might be someone who talks a lot, right, uh, yeah. and others who are quiet, and then the person who dominates uh, tends to. To, uh, you know, his or her view to the group, and that is what the researcher uh, hears, right? The dominant view, but it may not be the collective view of the participants, right? Uh, and to alleviate that, it's true that that can be a problem. To alleviate that, then the facilitator should be prepared for that situation. The facilitator, the moderator, should make sure that all the members all the members of the focus group who sit around the table, they they have the chance to raise uh, their view, right? You know, you only have five, six people together, maximum 10. So as a facilitator, you need to make sure, okay, oh, you, you are quiet. Do you want to share your thoughts? Yeah? Yeah. So Could that we... will depend on the skill of the facilitator to overcome that problem. Yeah, and the next is uh, uh, the, disadvantage, the disadvantage is uh, maybe the moderator is biased. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Also, and again, uh, the role of the facilitator plays a, a key role there. Yeah, and the advantage also from Rahma is we can have uh, various perspectives at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, and the next are in English. I think uh, maybe you'll be happy to read by yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I can see. Yeah, thank you. On uh, on, on that last point, there are multiple perspectives. Actually, this uh, focus groups could be seen as a quicker way to collect data than interviews. So imagine if you have to organize interviews with 10 people, that means 10 hours, right? But if you have a focus group, well, maximum an hour and a half, two hours, right? Uh, and in fact, within one hour, you, you can manage to get a lot of data from your 10 participants. So there are advantages and there are uh, a disadvantage. We have to be aware of these disadvantages so that we, we know how to handle them. And the experience and the skill of the facilitator, the moderator is key in this instance. Yeah. Okay, so let's thanks a lot for this uh, for this input. It's great to hear your views. Uh, I'll just go back to the presentation so we continue. Um, from the literature, um, uh, we uh, capture this focus group process framework. It kind of um, uh, it shows what we have to take into account when we are organizing focus groups. You know, obviously we have a certain outcome in mind, you know, to get a collective view of a specific phenomenon. In our case was about Facebook and experiences, metaphoric images uh, around um, 
uh, different users' experiences of, of Facebook. Uh, but we need to be aware of the process that the researcher needs to follow to reach a successful outcome. So the inputs, like the group proposition, who uh, you know who needs to be invited, the people who are invited to the focus group, obviously, it matters here. Um, we we will. Uh, I would like to uh, to say that it's many people from the same gender, perhaps, or people from the same age group, as we have done, kind of similar experiences. Um, uh, not too much diversity, because remember, you are aiming to collect kind of a, the collective voice, one that represents all the participants of the of the group. Where the focus groups take place, obviously this was pre-COVID. Uh, we had the choice to to host focus groups uh, in, in a specific venue at the university. We will invite people to come together. And it matters to, you know, to make people feel kind of comfortable. So achieving group cohesion is an important issue here. But also how the discussion takes place and the role of the moderator, and you yourselves have identified some of the challenges uh, that uh, the moderator you know, may experience, you know, a dominant sort of participant, someone who talks all the time, someone who is quiet. So the moderator needs to kind of step in and, and make sure that everybody you know, participates. There is no domination from anybody. So the discussion, therefore, is fair. Um, and captures all the different perspectives, uh, a successful outcome. So we've covered, um, uh, you know, a bit around uh, focus groups. Now I do want to uh, talk a little bit about interviews, which in fact is more common than focus groups. Often when we think of qualitative research, we tend to have in mind um, interviews, so one-to-one. -one. As the, as the sketch shows uh, so shows here, it's kind of uh, an interaction, a conversation, a research, a focused uh, research-related conversation between two individuals. Uh, the, obviously, there are different types of uh, of, of interviews. Uh, there are the qualitative interviews that are. Obviously, this is what we're interested in. But of course, there are the journalistic interviews. And it, it, in a way, it's, it's, it's important to distinguish between the two types of interviews. So the journalistic interviews are more interrogative. You are interrogating someone. You are almost coming into a confrontation with um, uh, the reporter, um, a newspaper reporter interviewing a politician. Right, so this is this would be different to a researcher, an academic researcher interviewing a participant, uh, a, a member of an organization. The journalistic interviews, of course, are highly public; they are visible. They could place any, uh, you know, at, at any time. They go out into the media; they're kind of exposed. Now, contrasting these journalistic interviews um, to what we are interested in, the qualitative interviews. The qualitative interviews tend to be more open-ended. We tend to avoid um, leading questions, right? In order to avoid the bias, you know, you yourselves talk about bias. Um, we are focusing on the individual and the experiences of that individual, the views of the individual. We don't want confrontation. We instead, the opposite, we want to build rapport with our interviewees. Why rapport matters? Well. If there's no report, there's no trust, right? They are not going to trust us to open up, to share their stories. They are not going to uh, answer our questions in the detail that we would like them to answer to that. They may say, oh, yes, no. Yes, I agree. Um, but I don't have anything else to say. And that's not good enough for, for a qualitative research. We want the story. We want the richness. We want uh, an explanation as to why they've done whatever they did and why they think uh, whatever they, they are thinking. And of course, they are not public. We have to ensure the confidentiality um, uh, of, of the participants, the name of the participant, the name of the organization that gave us access to participants doesn't, don't matter. Um, we should, in fact, change the names of the participants to ensure confidentiality. 
the are not interested is the data they give us access to. Yeah? Uh, there is, of course, reference to a power asymmetry. The, the, uh, you know, we want the interviewee to relax when we invite them for an interview. Uh, but, you know, nevertheless, the interview is being led by the researcher. So uh, there is a focus. There needs to be a focus because we, as researchers, we have a research question to answer, right? So uh, it's, it's driven very much by the, the researchers, um, uh, it, it could be seen as an instrumental, so there is an instrumental of gold to it. To it. Um, some also describe it as a manipulative dialogue because you are kind of manipulating the conversation to get the results, the kind of the, you direct the discussion in the way you want it. But you only do this because you have an aim to achieve, which is to respond to your research question. Some of the characteristics of qualitative research, you know, they, they try to capture life well experiences or real experiences, capture the meaning that the participants give to others. Um, obviously, it's qualitative, descriptive. We, we encourage description, elaboration. Um, it's a very much focus. Uh, it could be ambiguous. The phenomenon is explored, maybe uh, not that clear. There's some ambiguity around it, but we... Our role as researchers, we want to resolve that uh, um, uh, ambiguity. Uh, the, our experience, and that's, that's what the interview should be. It should be a positive experience for both the interviewee and the researcher, right? And, and this is hugely important because if it, is a, if it is an enjoyable experience, then the interviewee is more likely to open up, to share more of their stories their experiences, their views, etc. Uh, if they if they see it as confrontational, uh, they are not going to give their best. They are not going to give you their best stories. Yeah, uh, and also you want to be able to go back to that individual. You know, in case the, the research later on requires that you contact your participants again, you want to leave the door open, as we say. Yeah, so go back to go back to them. At different stages of the interviewing inquiry, um, you know, obviously interviewing, the actual act of interviewing appears as stage three. You don't start a project just by kind of going straight down into the field to interview. You have to do the preparation work that we talked about earlier, kind of understand the area you want to investigate, kind of the thematizing, what is the theme, what are the research questions, design the research, uh, the best kind of research methods you need to use to collect the data. You carry out the interviews, but after the interview is kind of transcribing, analyzing, which could be a lengthy uh, pro uh, a process, verifying. At this stage six, you may actually go back to the participants and, and kind of show them the, the findings and kind of get their response. Um, so it's important to leave the door open. You can go back to the participants and then you report the findings. So it's a kind of lengthy process that you go through as a qualitative uh, researcher. Um, so there are the preparation stages prior to the interview. And of course, those important stages, four, five, six, seven, um, to follow having collected the data. So in the chat again, I will encourage you to create a list of common issues that might cause problems or may go wrong during a qualitative research interview. So take two minutes uh, you know, to write your thoughts here and hopefully we have enough data for um, you know, to have a good um, a good response from everybody. So, what could go wrong? Yes, so yeah. what could go wrong is that you know you, you are late. You know, you as a researcher may be late going to the interview, right? Or your participant is late to come to the interview. So, you know, you haven't utilized the whole time. Sorry, sorry, please. Uh, it's all right. You, you want to go on, Professor Nikki? Sorry, I, I'll just pause and maybe allow the participants to, to think. 
of uh, of problems that could arise. So yeah, maybe take two or three minutes and and just uh, contribute to the chat. I'll stop. Ya silakan uh, mungkin uh, ada yang mau menyumbangkan pikiran kira-kira apa sih uh, kejadian tidak terduga ketika saat kita melakukan interview. Ada yang lain? Some very good ideas in the chat. So some of you talk about um, misunderstandings between the interviewee and the interviewer. That's that's true. Um, and and the interviewer needs to be ready to explain a question, right? To simplify the question because the interviewee, the participant, might not you know may not be able to understand. Um, so use simple language in the way you ask the questions, right? The respondent may change their minds. Um, they may not want to talk much. Yeah, that's such a challenge, of course. Yeah. The, the interviewers, yeah, may, may not think of any follow-up questions, right? And that's the end of the interview. If you run out of questions, that's, that's it, yeah. The participant is not engaged. Yeah, that's, that's true, and I have been in situations like that where the participant agrees to take part in the study, but they only give you 15 minutes, right? And then you you kind of wanted 45 minutes or 60 minutes and uh, and, and the participants, uh, they are too busy and they have to rush to a meeting or or, or whatever. 15 minutes interview, well, it's, it's, it's not sufficient, right? So you may decide not to use that. Uh, Yeah, the timing of the interviews, um, the availability, of course, of the participants, the participant may get offended. So lots of things. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, lots of things could go wrong, actually. Um, so as a researcher, you have to be aware of possible problems and, uh, and, and be able to kind of handle them, right? It comes with experience, even if you are new into um uh, interviewing, yeah, you may face some of these problems, it may put you off, but the more you do it, the better you get at it. Yeah. So don't give up. If, it, if this is something you enjoy, if this is a research method you want to adopt, it's it's a very um, uh, interesting experience, very insightful um, method, you know, to use. And it, the more you do it, the better, as I said, you, you get to. Trust, trust in that relationship matters a lot. Okay, that's uh, that's brilliant. So let's go to the next slide then. You can continue if you have any further ideas. Uh, what I've seen in the chat um, is, is great. If, if anybody has something else to say, you know, please add it uh, because, you know, it helps, it helps others who are reading your comments to, to understand better um, the challenges that uh, the researcher may face during the during the interview. Yeah. Of course, before you go to the interview, you need to do your preparation work, right? So you need to design uh, your interviews or your in interview protocol, as, as we often call it, um, and of course, recruit the right people to take part. Um, so define your sample, you know, decide, um, you know, who is going to um, take part in the study. 
right? Are you looking for, um, you know, Facebook users? If, if so, perhaps anybody around you and everybody around you is a Facebook user, but perhaps you are looking for, uh, as we did in our first study among Facebook users. Uh, and in fact, it was quite challenging in our study to find 50 to 60 years old to participate in the study. It was more easy to find teenagers to take part in the study and university students because we were kind of interacting with university students all the time. But the more mature users, uh, it, it, it was a little bit sort of more, more challenging. But nevertheless, that's something you have to think about and clearly uh, uh, putting in the design of your um, uh, of your research method so to define who the participants uh, will be uh, in order to you know achieve that generalizability but also the transferability we talked about uh, diversity diversity in your sample is also proposed as a criterion so in other studies we um, managed to bring diversity into the sample by uh, making sure that we interview participants uh, across uh, different genders, across different ages, with cultural diversity, they come from different countries, they speak different language, etc. Diversity could also be achieved by interviewing people from different organizations, right? So when you do research in organizations in management research as, as I do, then you know using different organizations in your sample becomes important. So and it adds this diversity. So you are not just talking to people from the same organization, even though this could be a choice if you have decided to have a single case study uh, approach, or you may interview, as we have done recently in a, in a recent project on digital transformation where we wanted to understand how uh, um, uh, digital leaders um, uh, go about uh, digital transformation, we interviewed, uh, you know, we approach actually digital leaders that um, uh, uh, from, from LinkedIn. So we use LinkedIn as the source uh, to identify, to recruit participants. Uh, and we identify sort of digital leaders in, in a range of organizations and sectors. So, so that, that brought diversity. Recruiting participants, I already said that you could use Again, the, the, the digital platforms that are accessible to, to identify suitable participants to your, uh, to your, um, uh, to your study. Um, if you are looking for um, access to a single organization, you need to think carefully uh, which this organization will be. Do you have access to this organization? Do you know anybody who works in this organization? Sometimes that's how we start, by identifying a gatekeeper. Uh, you may have a friend or a friend of a friend who works in a specific organization and you contact them and therefore they kind of open the gate to you. Uh, they introduce you to the organization and relevant people. And therefore you start contacting uh, people. Yeah. So it's the insider assistant, some, someone who is in the inside helps you with the recruitment. Um, another approach that I've used in some other studies is a snowball sampling where you identify um, a few participants to start with, you interview them, but then at the end of the interview say, can you introduce me to someone else? Yeah, so recently I was interviewing female IT contractors um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I came across some um, through uh, uh, an IT organization, through an, an IT association, an industry association, I came. At, uh, I was given access to a few, uh, and then through them, I was also using the snowball technique. Uh, you kind of say, "Oh, can you introduce me to someone else? Uh, someone from your network? Uh, do you think there is someone else I can talk to?" And and this kind of adds to your. Uh, um, number of participants, right? So there are different techniques you can use. A question that is often asked uh, is uh, how many interviews? Uh, a question is asked by students or, or junior researchers uh, or, or, or experienced researchers. You know, we have been asking this question in a recent, another recent project. 
uh, we've done, it's a, it's a recent project, it's a research project I'm working with colleagues in Copenhagen uh, Business School. And we've been talking to people who experience uh, remote working as a result of lockdown in different European countries. And we reached a point where we had about 34 and we produced a conference paper, we presented it in the summer. But the question we had following that was, okay, we have 34 participants, is this enough? Is this enough to have a good publication in a top journal, right? Uh, and, and, and actually at that stage we thought, uh, no, maybe it's not enough because the top journals require 50 plus interviews normally. And in fact, just before this lecture this morning, I had a meeting with my colleagues um, and, and we have reached, at this stage, we have reached 50 interviews, right? So even though we had 34, a good number of participants, in order to improve the data set, to improve your chances of publishing to a better journal, you go for more interviews, yeah? Um, to answer this question, um, I asked um, a professor in my previous university, Andrew Brown, who has, uh, who has written uh, a lot on how many interviews do you, you know, are you expected to have for a, a good qualitative study? And his response was, well, there are no is the answer. There's no single answer. Uh, every, every study is different. Some studies can do with 10 interviews with 15, 20 interviews. Uh, others may require the 30 and 50 interviews, right? So it depends on, it always depends on the purpose of your study. So for in-depth case studies, ethnographic projects, uh, he himself would recommend to his uh, doctoral students to undertake at least 50, uh, kind of 50 uh, as uh, kind of the, the minimum, as a number to have in mind when you're planning your um, uh, your study but of course you know he acknowledges that if if your case study only has 12 employees where are the 50 interviews going to come from so you can interview all 12 employees and that's 100 percent participation from the organization right so it really depends what you're looking to to understand um, but you know you can see the importance of answering this question uh, and of course depending where you plan to publish. Yeah. Different interviews, uh, this is depending on kind of the structure, how you structure your interviews. We could have a structured interview where uh, you go into the interview with a list of questions, 10, 15 questions, uh, and you aim to answer all of them, one by one, and that's your interview. That's the end of the interview. You don't diverge from from those questions, right? So it's like going with a questionnaire. Um, more commonly, however, in qualitative research, we see the use of semi-structured interviews. Uh, and this is when you go to an interview with a list of guiding questions to guide your conversation, your interaction with the participant, um, but you are also open to the possibility of raising additional questions, depending what the interviewee said. So the interviewee might have brought up a very interesting topic. You've never thought of it before when you were designing the study. And so, oh, that's intriguing. So you, you ask for, for more, right? So this is kind of semi-structure, always remaining open. Um, and I think as a, as a qualitative researcher, you, uh, you know, semi-structure has a lot of relevance. Another approach might be, of course, the unstructure. So you don't go with any questions. It's kind of, let's, let's chat. Let's chat about your conversation, yeah. But often, again, in qualitative research, you know, the time matters. For any kind of project, time matters. You may have three months, a year, or, but, but time goes very quickly. So you need to be guided by the aim of your study, the research question as well. So in a way, the semi-structure interview uh, makes sense and that explains the popularity of this type of interview. 
uh, other type of interviews or, or, you know, obviously in terms of uh, how we carry them out, right? So it could be face-to-face. Uh, yeah, pre-COVID, that's how we thought of interviews. We take a train, you travel to meet someone for, for an hour. And, you know, so that's kind of the whole day. Um, other means, of course, um, were, were used, not so uh, frequently, pre-COVID, telephone, Skype, etc. Again, for one of my projects, uh, pre-COVID, I use Skype. Um, but then because of COVID, we don't have the means to have face-to-face -face interviews, less so. It's possible in some circumstances, but less so, more restrictive. And therefore, we are increasingly relying on um, platforms such as the one we use today, Zoom and Teams. Actually, they are great tools because they also allow us to record. You can record the, the interview and therefore you have a recording of the interview. You can easily uh, transcribe. Yeah. Um, uh, ideally, yes, face to face, but we have to consider the situation we are in, as well as the interviewees, uh, uh, you know, uh, participants. So, what do you need when you are carrying out qualitative interviews? Obviously, you need a guide. Uh, think of the setting where the interview will take place. Um, will you go to the participants' office if it is face to face? Will you meet somewhere? Then you know, invite them to your office. Um, you don't have to think of this, of course, if it's just a Zoom interview or, or Teams interview. Um, but it's very important, obviously, whatever the medium you use to aim to build rapport and trust that we recognize is very important. You introduce a project, you get consent, you ask the, the participants to sign a confidentiality agreement. Uh, how do you present and contact yourself as a researcher uh, uh, you know, you have to be um, uh, professional during the interview, show that you're prepared. Uh, you know, you are not wasting. You know, these people are giving of their valuable time to talk to you. Uh, and you don't want to be seen as wasting the, their time, right? And also always be prepared to respond to any questions they may have. Uh, so carrying out the interviews, probing prop them to clarify if they said something interesting, encourage them to say more. Wow, that's, that's very interesting. I haven't thought of this before. Can you give me an example of what you have in mind? Can you, can you explain to me um, how, how this or a project that you work on recently, um, a, a, any problems you experienced so recently? So be prepared to think of these additional questions, yeah? Uh, how you start and finish the interview, of course. Um, always finish the interview by leaving the door open, as we said earlier, in case you have to go back to ask for additional questions. Okay, so another exercise for you, another kind of take another few minutes here, how not to ask questions? What kind of mistakes may be made in interviews? Ya, silakan dijawab di kolom chat. Atau mungkin ada yang angkat tangan ya, kalau ingin bicara langsung. Uh, I think Professor Nikki, uh, maybe uh, I don't really know what do you mean by how not to ask questions. Uh, uh, your microphone is off. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry about this. Yeah, um, yeah, we we already have some some comments in 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 the chat. Um, so it could be the way you ask the questions, right? Uh, the question itself, how you phrase the question, right? That may be, you know, some, some people uh, here talks asking questions in a provocative tone, uh, kind of insulting or undermining, 
right? So it's the tone you use, uh, the question itself, of course, yeah. Uh, asking about something sensitive, someone says um, offensive. Um, yeah, um, Fran also says leading the participant to desirable answers. So that's again a way not to, not to bring into the interviews, right? Um, because that introduces bias in the data, in, in the data collection, right? So you tr you have to ask the question in a way that alleviates or minimizes sort of biases. Asking personal questions, right? Um, asking too many yes or no questions. So that's brilliant. Yeah, you've captured, um, you know, um, you know, lots of these mistakes. In fact, so that's that's brilliant. Yeah, I'll just move on uh, for the sake of time. So. So here you can see some mistakes. So leading questions, I mean, you've captured this, right? Um, asking too many questions at the same time, right? So you start asking one question and then you add another one and then kind of too many questions. The interviewee cannot catch up with you, right? Get confused. Judgmental questions that may sound like you are insulting the other person. Or, or failure to listen, that, that could be another mistake not so about the way you ask the question, but how you react to the participant's response to your question, right? So maybe they said something that is kind of interesting, you completely ignore it and you kind of move on um, to, to something else. You've missed the opportunity, right? So you, as, a, as an interviewer, you need to have very good listening skills. You are there not just to ask questions, okay? You may have the recorder, you may record the interview, but it doesn't mean that you should forget to listen, right? Uh, taking notes, of course, recording is essential during the interviews. Um, ah, okay, so here is a scenario for you. Okay, you finish an interview. Um, how she experiences her work and colleagues and switch off the recorder. You talk informally with the interviewee, you the, who then gives you new information. So you switch off the recorder that makes you see the interview and the interviewee colleagues in a new light. After the interview, the interviewee contradicts some of your earlier statements and criticizes her colleagues. Can you use this in your research? Uh, so you have, so you see after the formal interview, you switch off the recorder, and there is kind of the informal conversation happening with the interviewee and kind of fascinating data has been shared. Can you use this? Should the new information affect your subsequent interviews with the person's colleagues? What do you think? Ya, silakan. Uh, bagaimana pendapatnya bisa ditulis di kolom chat? Kalau kita in, apa interview orang, kemudian hmm, apa ada orang lain yang kontradiksi, kontradiks pernyataannya, lalu kita akan bagaimana? Akankah kita menggunakan data itu atau bagaimana? Any view on this? Silakan. So, Sadrio says maybe yes, yeah. Okay, so let, let me give my response to, to, to this one. Um, from my experience over the number of years, of 30 years, uh, that I've been uh, an academic researcher, you know, as part of my PhD and kind of later on in my career, I've talked to many people, lots of interviews. And in fact, it's, it's not uncommon that the moment you are just about to leave or you switch off the <laughs> recorder, remember in the olden days where we did have to carry a dictaphone with, with us, um, then 
the, the interviewee relaxes because they don't they know you are not recording you are not kind of capturing their 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 voice and they relax and they open up and they share some interesting information so i will say it's not uncommon for this kind of scenario to to happen during qualitative research because sometimes for the interviewee knowing that they are being recorded it may act as a drawback it may influence how much they share with you yeah um, and I know researchers who will try to avoid using a recorder for that reason, because they don't want to make the interviewee kind of anxious. Uh, rather, you know, the idea is that the interviewee relaxes and kind of open up. And therefore, if you don't use a recorder, you have to use take notes. You have to be really fast <laughs> in taking notes, but you have to practice. <laughs> So don't rely exclusively on the recorders and on the data you collect through the recorders. Yeah. So that would be my my advice. Yeah. Okay. So let me because we're looking at. I want to spend a few minutes uh, sort of talking about the analysis of the data. We already captured uh, some of the uh, kind of principles of this um, through your questions earlier. Um, the principles of analyzing qualitative uh, data, um, you know, unlike quantitative data where you, you may use uh, statistical packages to analyze the data you collected, here you are dealing with a lot of um, um, words, transcripts from interviews, documents you might have collected. And there are, of course, software packages um, like and and vivo is a uh, is is a popular one among researchers. Atlas T is another one. Um, uh, I know colleagues in the U.S. they they use Atlas Atlas T. Um, I'm a more traditional sort of uh, manual <laughs> um, data analysis person, where I like sort of going through the the transcripts and, and myself rather than relying on a software to analyze. Um, and identify the key themes of my data set. Whatever approach you decide to use, whether it's a software, my PhD students use software, and that's absolutely fine. You still need to understand the data, of course. You still need to read through your transcripts. You can't just rely on the package. You still need to kind of go through the details, um, you know, as, as, as the principles say there, proceed systematically. So we still need a systematic data analysis, uh, take notes or as you are proceeding from one stage to the other, record, um, you know, take take notes. You may, you something that's small perhaps that comes up at one point then becomes your big idea later on. Um, remain focused. Qualitative research often leads to rich data set. How you, you may be lost in the data. So the way about that is to use your research question to guide you through, right? The, 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 the qualitative data you collected might also answer other research questions. But for the purpose of the research you are doing at the moment, let's answer your initial research question. And let's write the report. Let's write the paper, submit it to a journal. Um, if you have other questions that have been answered, you can use that for another paper. So it's not uncommon among qualitative researchers to use the same data set to have kind of two, three papers, right? Because the richness in the data allow that to happen. You are responding every time you are responding because you cannot do that, yeah? Um, so the, the purpose of the data analysis is really to seek to explain, to explain and to enlighten to enlighten the field and contribute with new ideas and, and, and theories. And here is an exemplar paper I added later in the reference list. Uh, you know, some, you know, it's a paper by uh, well-known qualitative researchers, Masnamian, Olikowski and Gates, the organization science, and kind of words they use here in their paper to kind of explain the analytical approach they adopted. They refer to techniques drawing from grounded theory, 
They use interrogatives of textual analysis, going back through the text again and again, multiple authors, which means that they each read the text, they give their own interpretations, they focus on the main research idea, but they also remain open. Remember, we said that earlier, um, don't just be kind of too narrow when you're looking to uh, add your data, but be open at the same time. What are you looking for? You are looking for the words that people use in our study on Facebook uh, that I presented earlier. Those words matter to us. They led to the theoretical contribution of the study. They were talking about normal people. We are the normal people. It's normal to do things this way. So words they use kind of uh, give may give direction to the theory you're bringing. The context obviously where the data is coming from, the context of the participants, the situation that they're, they're in, uh, is of matters, um, consistencies, that's something that you need to be looking for. Is there a consistent message here by reading all these data set? What's the consistent, what's the strong message that comes out of this? Consistency, the frequency, the intensity of the words, the comments, the messages that come through. Uh, specificity, you know, again, we're thinking here of the research question, um, the trends, the main themes that come out of the data analysis. And, and that's how we go about. And that's, it's an iterative process. Uh, you go back to the words, you go back to the transcripts, you compare, you look for consistencies. And that's why the data analysis actually is a lengthy process in qualitative research. Yeah. Uh, some tactics for generating kind of that uh, that meaning, that consistency, um, looking for patterns, similarities, categories, clustering the data, putting them into groups, right? Um, comparing, making contrast, counting, okay, it's not a quantitative study, but still counting, you may find that Oh, the majority of the interviewees indicated that this issue matters. Well, that's, that shows that, yeah, this is it's a kind of strong finding. And seeing plausibility, looking for things that uh, explain, you know, give us a, a good explanation as to something, as to why something is, uh, is happening. Here is a slide why counting is important. I'll just skip this one. Uh, I'll just stay on this one a little bit. Um, in, in qualitative research, you need to look for what is plausible, right? Um, trust your plausibility. Often as researchers, we have kind of expectations and intuitions. However, don't just completely be influenced by, by your intuitions. Be open, remember? So remember what we said, be open to other plausibilities as well. Be open to other possibilities, explanations as to why a phenomenon takes place the way it does. And, and here, in fact, I'm, I'm prompting you to think, think of an example. Um, where uh, a situation where where this situation may may occur, you kind of um, during the analysis and conclusion, you think that something's possible, it makes sense, but there are risks too. Uh, what would the implications for the data analysis be? So, can you think of an example where you are bringing your intuition into the data analysis and it kind of um, uh, it doesn't help, right? It hurt the data analysis instead. If anybody has an example, that's absolutely fine. I, if, uh, that would be great. Otherwise, I'll just share my example quickly. You may go into the field and you're looking uh, for gender differences. So you may go into an organization and asking questions about, um, you know, how, how people felt um, um, uh, sort of uh, working remotely during the lockdown. Uh, and you are kind of expecting that there would be gender differences. So you kind of expect that women will um, uh, give you certain findings that would be different to those uh, from men. But if, when you do that, you may miss out other possibilities, such as the age difference. 
So it may be that gender doesn't matter as much. In, in fact, it is the age of the participants that is more crucial in the specific scenario. Have an open. Don't just kind of go with a specific perspective and expect that that would be the answer that you that you get because it may not be that one. Yeah. To conclude, you know, the researcher's role is hugely um, important, as you, I'm sure you've gathered from, from this presentation today. The, the skill, the experience of the researchers um, uh, has a lot to do with the quality, not just of the data you collected, also of the analysis. And if you feel you know, for an academic project, for those who are academics in the audience, if you uh, want to uh, use these uh, qualitative methods, if you feel that you don't have the experience, then my advice is that try to work with someone who has the experience. There would be a lot to learn. And I've, I've learned a lot myself. So working with other people who, who uh, have been a lot more experienced than myself in, uh, in collecting and analyzing. Especially the analysis of the data, I've, I've worked with some top academics in, in, in the field and, and kind of learning from the way they are thinking and kind of playing around with the analysis is, is, is a huge opportunity. And because it's, the researcher is the main instrument in qualitative research, right? And, and, and I said earlier, qualitative research for me is like embarking on, a, on an adventure. Every qualitative project that I start is a, is a new kind of journey, right? You start with a specific um, uh, question, but you don't know where it's going to end up. It, it's going to be messy. It may be chaotic at times. You may get sort of lost. Often we do when we deal with qualitative data, but it's, it's hugely, um, it's, it, 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 it's hugely beneficial, yeah. And some references here, I'm going to pass the, the slides to, to Dia, some references that I've used uh, and suggested readings and exemplar studies for qualitative um, research. So thank you very much for the session today. Wow, it's, it's, it's 11 o'clock my time, so it's two hours. Up. But I'm, I'm happy to stay on for, for questions. Thank you very much for your great talk. Unfortunately, we only have two hours. I want to have more, but here it's our time to to because it's very late here it's 5 p.m here so yes yeah i would like also to thank all of the participants for your enthusiasm i hope you learned something from today's talk and i hope we we will see more qualitative studies in the future from indonesia thank you very much professor nikki uh, uh we talk later soon See you. Uh, Thank and you very bye -bye. much, dear, for inviting me and, and to all the many participants who came to this session this afternoon. Um, uh, thanks for giving me this great opportunity. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I, I wish you all the best and uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.